here for. Um, we're, you're not here for us. You're here for Dr. Anton Antonov. So, hi, Dr. Anton. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you again. Um, but uh, we're going to let you take it away. I think people are tired of hearing us speak. So, um, um, all right. <laughs> go ahead. I'm going to. I need to be enabled to share my screen. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. All right. I think you should have that. I don't know why that Zoom is being so wonky today. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, perfect. Awesome. awesome. Good. So, uh, yeah, so far it is great. Um, so, um, in this uh, presentation, I'm going to talk about mostly about COVID-19 epidemiological uh, modeling simulations. A particular type of modeling uh, is going to be the majority of the presentation. This is the compartmental uh, modeling, but I'm going to uh, mention some other modeling paradigms. Uh, the, the presentation is mostly in R. I wanted to present as much as I can in R, uh, but some uh, of the um, of the examples look and uh, seem much better in Mathematica. I and Mathematica are very close. Uh, so if you know one of them, you can relatively quickly become good in the, in the other. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is because I consider myself a good uh, R programmer. I have used R intensively for the last seven years. I have used Mathematica for more than 25 years. I'm a former kernel developer of Mathematica. Um, so in a, I'm going to introduce uh, further myself, but just to kind of give a quick overview of what uh, what's going on. Uh, this here, there are a couple of uh, big pictures, actually three big pictures uh, I want to talk about. And the first one, which is the most important for this, uh, um, for this presentation, it's uh, most targeted, is uh, we have this uh, giant loop, loop of uh, modeling development and decision making. We're making this kind of models in order to help decision makers. So it's not just for you know our own enlightenment and um, we actually, I don't know, we probably target the betterment of the human race and so forth, or you know, less tiring. So uh, this, uh, this is what we, we kind of do. We gather data for the phenomena we observe in this particular case, COVID-19. Uh, we do different uh, data analysis and uh, um, data manipulations, we develop new models and we discuss them. I am going to talk about the data preparation and data analysis using Apple data, Apple mobility data, and New York Times, um, New York Times data. Uh, the model development, multiple models, multiple paradigms can be done. To some extent, this uh, presentation is, you know, belongs to this, uh, to this part of this uh, big, uh, big picture. Uh, it is, uh, we need to discuss the models in order to be sure that, you know, the models are accurate or uh, they don't have some, say, logical mistakes or they address the needs uh, of, uh, of different stakeholders. So usually with uh, modeling, we, as I said, we do models uh, in order to make predictions, in order to make decisions. But um, we don't, we, before doing to actual decision and calibration of the models and decision based on the predictions, we can actually gather certain scenario playouts and just do different simulations in order to uh, form a feel of what is the problem area. Like without actual concrete data, we would know that this process have some, say certain um, properties, certain type of evolution, which you might be not aware of if you just have observed the, pro the process. Model calibration is extremely important. We should try to calibrate as quickly uh, or as soon as possible, but it's also a very uh, time consuming process. Uh, it shouldn't, it uh, should be uh, done in conjunction with the different scenario playouts uh, people are interested in. For example, the models we are going to be discussing, we can try to calibrate, and calibrate them with real data from Hubei or from New York or, and so forth. Um, the scenario playouts, this is about um, trying to enact different scenarios, like say, should we quarantine? Should we let New Yorkers to come to Florida? Should we, you know, uh, do, um, do track, uh, track uh, you know, 
uh, people who who have the disease and some other things like that and if you do that like say what are the parameters for all this uh, kind of scenarios like you know how long are the quarantines how many people you are going to to allow to come from say new york to florida how many cell phones need to install certain application in order to uh, in order for you to have uh, critical mass to have adequate models and so forth these are all par parameters of the of the models uh, of the scenarios uh, we're interested in ideally usually the models run for quite a lot of time so it is a good idea to actually have some sort of uh, uh, model management uh, batch simulation or bulk simulations what i have said here store, store the experimental results and then with different dashboards, statistics, visualizations, and so forth, bring this to the decision makers. Obviously, this loop can be, you know, the decision makers might have an input here, or they can influence uh, the, the modeling process. <clears throat> All right, so uh, the, the other big picture is, um, is the, the combination of the model with uh, the epidemic models with uh, economy models. To some extent, this is my uh, this is my interest here, uh, and so I, I am interested in epidemic modeling. But for me, this pairing of the epidemic modeling with the economic models and what is going to be the impact on the economy and how, what kind of policies for epidemic control or what kind of policies for uh, medical supplies uh, should be put in place uh, at what time, with what schedule, with what quantities in order to uh, to have the the desirable or the least uh, undesirable uh, epidemic impact of the epidemic on the economy uh, so this here can be a very complicated uh, uh, system for for certain i mean just for simplicity i have separated into two and uh, so here you know we have the epidemic model and the economy model the third picture of the third big um, Actually, I'm not sure how much should I talk about this, but okay, I, I'm supposed to, let me see. I thought I can do this with my uh, clicking on the link there, but um, I'm going to bring up uh, some some link which uh, was supposed to work from, from the, by clicking into the mind map. Okay, so, all right. Um, I'm writing, this is actually, this first big picture is to introduce myself and what I'm doing and why I'm doing this or this presentation to begin with. So I'm writing a book, uh, actually three books, uh, how to be a data scientist imposter. The, the other two books, uh, they're simplified machine learning workflows and software design uh, methods in Wolfram language. Uh, they, the, both, both of these books, actually all three of them uh, use Mathematica and R to an equal degree. Uh, so I do have some other GitHub repositories, like, say like this one, in which uh, I do extensive comparisons between Mathematica and R over different uh, different type of projects. And so in this diff different kind of projects, they might uh, involve uh, different type of uh, machine learning algorithms. So um, why I'm telling you this, uh, this actually is something one of the organizers of this uh, group presented two, three years ago in uh, the data science salon conferences. Um, so it, I'm more or less, I adhere to this. I'm nearly perfect, except I'm close-minded. Yes, I have the human interest. I'm creative, analytical, know how to do business, but I really don't, uh, not that open-minded when it comes to the, you know, new technologies and new methodologies. They usually, I mean, I really want to, to test them. And to some extent, that's why I'm talking for com about comparisons. I'm talking about a different uh, type of um, methods being utilized to tackle the same problem from, from the real world. Uh, so <clears throat> you might have heard this, it's better to be a fox than a hedgehog. And yes, this is what I'm, uh, what I'm also uh, want to, one of the reasons I'm showing this lecture is that uh, people who use R, most of the time they come from statistical and uh, like data science, machine learning background. And um, data science and machine learning, they're not that adequate when it comes to uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, epidemiological models. Other models should be considered and should be taken into account. This is the, this is the models, uh, uh, the modeling point of view, which I'm going to be uh, discussing uh, discussing next. So before, I usually in my presentations, I try to show the most interesting, um, 
the most interesting plots or the most interesting uh, visualizations before I proceed, I'm going to do uh, do just that because I think this was quite a lot of hand waving. What I'm doing right now, I'm running a dashboard on my local computer on all of my other screens. This dashboard is going to bring up uh, some, um, is going to show a certain, uh, certain model. Uh, this is, uh, I'm, we're going to discuss what this uh, stands for, but this is, um, susceptible, exposed, infected. We have two infected populations, hospitalized and recovered model, a recovered um, population model. This model has all these um, uh, five um, um, types of populations. So here, if I change some, say some of the quarantines, you know, like quarantines parameters, like say the length of the quarantine or where the quarantine starts, I should start seeing some uh, different, uh, different behavior in the curves here. Uh, another interesting thing for me to do, uh, this type of models, they're actually uh, not adequate when you apply to some big country like say US. And uh, so uh, that's why I'm very interested in the multi-site modeling. What exactly this multi-site modeling is, is going to be into the second part of, um, of the presentation. All right, I'm going to close this dashboard and I'm going to proceed with, um, um, with the data analysis. And why we're doing data analysis? Well, of course, uh, we need to do data analysis because we need to form some idea of what, what is the problem, what is the, what we're dealing with. And so uh, I have taken two, uh, two data sources. I'm going to bring this uh, our studio environment. So you can see, let's look first into the uh, the one from New York Times. So New York Times, they have taken a different uh, uh, Different, different data from uh, uh, different uh, municipalities, uh, different counties in USA. And they have aggregated in the data in some way. You can see I'm reading the data directly from GitHub. They, they uh, update that data daily. And um, so they have both for counties and for states. And so here I'm taking some additional data in order to know where the locations, where the geographical locations of the counties, which uh, uh, New York Times have, the, have gathered the information for, and then I'm making this, uh, this plots here. And ideally, okay, I'm going to leaflet, using leaflet is, uh, is great, but sometimes in interactively, uh, yeah, well, I, I'm trying to, to zoom here. Yeah, we can see, I mean, more or less, this is what we expect when it comes to uh, the places, you know, the places which are with uh, biggest impact. I am actually going to close this because interactively it produces some problems. Heat maps, this is actually very interesting. We can actually do some clustering on the different states based on the, on the time evolution of what was, uh, what was happening. This is what you see on the x-axis. This is the time, the dates, and these are the different states on the y-axis, and we can do some clustering and, and et cetera. Um, the other is um, we can do, of course, we can aggregate the time series and start to do some predictions. This is not what this presentation is about. I mean, it's not this present, this type of predictions, this forecast is just for illustration purposes. And uh, in order to, to have the ability to do this kind of time series uh, simulations, oh, sorry, time series operations, uh, not so much um, as the end result of what we're trying to achieve here. All right, so, and the um, Apple mobility data, this is pretty straightforward. Um, Apple mobility trends data is very interesting. Um, <clears throat> they have taken the data from uh, different regions and um, for a long time, actually yesterday, I started using the most recent data from May. Before that, I used uh, uh, the first release, which was from April, which is much smaller. And some of the um, plots, some of the statistics made more sense for that smaller set. But anyway, this data set uh, here tells, me, tells us what is the, uh, what is the volume of um, uh, directions requests uh, through to, to Apple, to Apple Maps. And you can see that the reference date is uh, January 13. That's why it's 100. Everything else, you know, like everything else is normalized by that. And we have different um, geographical, uh, geographical regions and they, they are basically both countries or they are cities. I'm not sure, do I have a city here? Uh, but, and uh, the other thing is you can see is that we have uh, different three types of transportations. 
let me see, maybe it's obvious in the summaries. We have driving, tra transit, and walking. I assume transit includes both uh, trains and, um, and buses. And yeah, I mean, you can see the different, uh, uh, different uh, type of uh, geographical regions which we look into. So uh, I'm going to, I mean, I convert this to a long form trying to do the heat map plots. They're not that informative using logarithmic. Uh, this is more interesting. I would say, you know, if we want to group, uh, I'm going to talk more about this, about this clustering and grouping, but this actually here should be showing how we, let me see, can I make a uh, interactive plot here, right? So you can see how the different countries uh, cluster according to, um, according to, they, to the usage of the Apple maps. And this is the dates here on which these requests are made. So what is, uh, what is uh, uh, happening, you know, uh, this kind of clustering, I, I want to actually expand upon it, but how does time series look like? And yeah, I have aggregated them, but, um, you know, still we can actually make some uh, observations and conclusions here. First, we see uh, the orange lines. These are the, um, uh, they mark Sundays. So this is uh, every, between two orange uh, lines, you have uh, seven days, right? So this is the week. So we can see that uh, people basically on Sunday, they don't need directions that much. I guess they're staying at home and, you know, doing whatever, um, being lazy or watching TV or whatever. Um, I'm not going to, ex to conjecture too much about it, but uh, obviously we see what say around Friday, Friday and Saturday, uh, they're much, people are much more active. They, they're much more adventurous, it seems, or they're in places where they don't know uh, what is, you know, where they are. This, some of this uh, make uh, quite a lot of sense, especially if you look at, uh, is it driving, is it transit, uh, is it something else? Again, this is aggregated across all countries. And you can see uh, that uh, this starts in uh, January uh, 13th, right? And so there was some lockdown in different countries, but you know, some countries relaxed, relaxed uh, that lockdown and now it's uh, picking up. And so, um, all right. And so what I said, well, I want to expand on this. Let's actually, um, let me see what I'm doing here. Well, we can apply related semantic analysis to this, uh, to this type of data, to these matrices we see here. We can apply related semantic analysis and do some clustering. Uh, I actually try to do it with graphs in R, but the results are not very pretty. So that's why I'm going to show you uh, results uh, with clustering using uh, Mathematica. Uh, so using the so-called community plots, we can actually uh, see that there are certain, you know, certain interesting configurations, interesting clusters between different countries, uh, between different cities and so forth. Like for example, we can see here that these are all Japanese uh, cities and this is about transit. Well, Japan is a relatively small country, notorious with a great uh, transit system. So obviously they're going to have their own uh, local crust cluster separated from the rest and you know, they're tightly related to each other. Uh, so I actually have two panels you might have observed here. My Mathematica uh, presentations are going to be on this right panel. On the left one, it's what is uh, the main presentation using uh, related semantic analysis. Yeah, we uh, in uh, if I cannot plot graphs, I can actually do topic extraction. This is what is happening here. And I can extract the topics, but I have something better here. Uh, and this better thing is a uh, uh, time series search engine. With this time series search engine, when it comes up, it's actually since, um, yeah. So I'm going to, I assume uh, because this is in uh, South Florida, Miami, I'm going to search for Miami here and say, let's look into uh, city driving in Miami. And um, not surprisingly, the most, uh, the, the nearest neighbors, the top 21 nearest neighbors of uh, the time series for city driving in Miami. We are basically, we have like uh, Broward County, which is for Lauderdale. And uh, we are also, you know, like uh, Palm Beach and so forth, right? And Orlando, uh, uh, th this, all, uh, this all actually makes sense. What is interesting, but we actually see also San Diego, which actually is uh, more or less in the same uh, in the same uh, latitude, right? It's in California, but you know, it, there, there are lots of similarities say, maybe we can conjecture in uh, the way people drive in uh, San Diego and they drive in, in, uh, in Miami. I'm going to do some other uh, stuff here, like say, like we look into Tokyo, let's look at Tokyo transit. And so 
the trials at Tokyo, and yeah, you can see the, um, obviously they had some kind of lockdown policy, then relax, then lockdown again, I guess, uh, or something, right? So uh, yeah, you can see again, like uh, they're very close. This actually explains this type, time series. You see how close this time series, are? they're very different from the previous ones we saw. Like say, if I take, uh, I don't know, if I take uh, Chicago, for example, just a moment. Uh, I'll be having uh, probably very different, uh, very different uh, time series, right? And so, um, and I, okay, so this explains why we, we get uh, we get clusters. Uh, and I I wanted to make one more here, like say Scandinavian countries. They seem to be very similar to each other. So uh, Copenhagen in driving in Copenhagen, uh, very similar to say Groningen. This is in Sweden. Uh, other Denmark, uh, Oslo, in Norway, and so forth, right? Uh, I can actually, in this particular case, maybe Pearson correlation uh, for finding the nearest neighbors is not that adequate. I mean, you can see that there's slightly different, um, uh, different parts. Another thing we can do is uh, find uh, uh, trades, uh, sorry, trends, and I'm going to gain, again use uh, uh, a larger number of uh, nearest neighbors. So I basically have picked uh, some trend, like, strictly upwards, like because everything we saw was actually going downwards, right? But wh what is going upwards? And you, know, you can see that there's some, apparently some countries, they do actually, uh, they, even if they lock down, they're actually picking it up quite intensively right now. Uh, another type of profile I might be looking up is say, okay, let's see up and down maybe because it's interesting. I mean, uh, yeah, I, was, I assume quite a lot of uh, this kind of countries are going to have this, um, uh, this, um, this uh, profile similarly, you know, down and up. Uh, so this is like, this is a search engine based on on the trend we have specified. Ideally, I, I should be using some kind of tablet or smartphone and drive whatever uh, draw what kind of curve I want in order to produce uh, this type of similarities. So all right, I'm not going to dwell more on that. This these are all important in order to study the data. They're not the most important thing. They're just a necessary step in order to get informed uh, how to do how to do simulations so basically we are doing this uh, data preparation data analysis in order to do to do better modeling and so uh, i'm going to be uh, talking about uh, um, the modeling uh, uh, and uh, before going into that let me go back to the mind map here and one of the things i did not say in the beginning uh, in each of, after each of these sessions, I'm going to be asking for questions and uh, in every 10, 15 minutes in the middle, I'm going to be asking for questions. So uh, any kind of, any questions right now I need to answer? I mean, I'm asking the uh, hosts. Yeah, Why we do ask? have one question um, mm -hmm. from Evan Oster. He's asking if population density at the county level in the US enters into your model or the analysis that you're currently showing. Well, um, Great question. And I mean, if I want to, uh, unfortunately, this was not um, something I was planning to do uh, right now, but um, I mean, I can do it nevertheless. And so let me, let me show you how this is done. Well, uh, when I said I'm doing multi-site modeling, uh, this is one of the reasons because these models, they don't the, the way the, the dashboard I showed you, uh, uh, usually they simulate the whole thing over one cell. And that's simply not adequate. Uh, actually, I was going to talk about this, but let me answer this question and I'm going to give more detailed answer. So you can see here, this is actually in the models, right? Here, I mean, in just, just to make uh, quicker computations, I partitioned uh, USA in these hexagons, which are relatively with relative, relatively large radius. And so you can see in this hexagon, I have 23 million people. This is Florida, South Florida, right? We say the organizers are uh, 6 million people and so forth. If I have specified, uh, say, let me see, somewhere here, I should be able to specify that I want to have a smaller, a smaller, um, a smaller density and, uh, no, 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 no. Okay, anyway, uh, let me stop this. And I, I, as I said, I was planning to talk about this, uh, if this uh, comes up quickly. Uh, but anyway, what I wanted to show is that, yes, I can change, say, the, the bins, the size of the, this hexagonal bins. 
And because of this, I might produce more detailed uh, simulations, more closer to what is actually happening uh, when it comes to the special distribution. I mean, you should see that they're basically, yeah, they're, the cells are smaller. This is still running. It's going to produce uh, some simulations and some maps with the, with the deaths which uh, have been, I'm actually taking here the deaths from, from New York Times. So uh, let me see, somewhere here. Uh, when I'm ingesting the, the data, uh, they, I mean, it should be, yeah, it should be taking the one from, yeah, from New York Times. Well, it cannot see it here, but well, I guess you need to take my word for it. Anyway, this is, in, this is done in Mathematica. This is what I'm going to be discussing um, um, at some point. And actually, uh, let's, um, it is also related to, um, before discussing those models, I do actually want to discuss what is the two other things. What are the decision maker questions? Because this type of question I was asked, you know, do I use the population density? It should be tied up to what the decision makers uh, would ask uh, for, this, uh, for this kind of modeling. The other is what are the alternatives? I mean, I'm showing you one particular, so far I have shown you one way to do things. This is the compartmental modeling, there are two or three others. All right, so this is still calculating. I'm going to let it uh, calculate. Uh, what are the, let me see, can I do this easily? Uh, I'm using uh, morphological analysis and uh, morphological analysis is a very convenient way uh, to, to make breakdown or make uh, of things for problems which are hard to describe and also the so-called wicked problems and also to make discoveries in science. This was morphological analysis was used to quite extensively uh, to do some discoveries in astronomy. So what you see here, I have made, um, uh, I have made this table uh, in which we have um, on the rows, you see the, say, whatever are my modeling tools, like this is data, methods, and algorithms, right? When I say methods, I mean methodologies, because they're different methodologies. Same algorithms can be used in different methodologies, but even if you use the same algorithm because you're using the same different methodologies, you might get different results or different conclusions. Uh, so the decision maker, maker questions were put uh, here to the left. How, how well, I mean, the organizers, I have a question. How well do you see this? Should I zoom it or? No, I think it's, it's good. All right. So yeah. um, for example, we have some sort of questions like say, uh, where is, where is the patient zero and what happens, you know, how patient zero is going to propagate, you know, uh, throughout US. This actually was one of the, uh, probably it's an interesting uh, question on its own right. Let me see. I didn't want to discuss it uh, in this group, but maybe I do have something, um, um, something related to that. And so I'm going to try to see, uh, do I, if I have it around. And I don't think I do. So anyway, uh, but anyway, well, uh, we you can see with the previous maps I was showing, right? So I have partitioned US in some way. Uh, this non-regular graph lines. These are this comes from the airlines. So this is how what is, what is happening here. Yes, I can actually try to see if say this is around the Seattle area. If uh, some um, uh, you know, patient zero came in Seattle. I want to see how is this going to propagate throughout US. Uh, so, uh, yeah, for the special distribution, obviously, you know, the special distribution, we can have a variety of questions, you know, like what is the effect of the special dis distribution uh, to the, to this kind of simulations, to anything we do. I mean, obviously different populations, different distribution, different traveling patterns, they're going to produce a different uh, impact of, uh, of what, is, uh, what is going to be um, simulated and predicted. I'm going to bring up some uh, data from uh, some uh, file, which, uh, let me see. Um, so, I mean, this is for Botswana, and Botswana is the size of Texas. And so I want to show, yeah, okay, like we can see, for example, this actually happens in US and most of the states in US. You, whatever kind of uh, country you have, you have relatively few, uh, few um, cities in which the population is concentrated. And so, uh, but the reason I'm bringing this up is that this model here, what you can see, I have this uh, layered part, right? And so my, the populations and these hexagons, which I'm using to partition the populations and make simulations within each hexagon. 
because I think my models are going to be more adequate instead of doing it over the whole, uh, the whole country or the whole region. Uh, so this is what is the first layer. The second layer, these are the roads and the third layer is uh, a railway, say. And uh, so this model, which is for a single site, for one of the single, single hexagons, I am executing this model. Of course, I can execute it over the whole country, but what is happening and what I'm going to be discussing in the multi-site models is how this, uh, this model on the top, which I have uh, uh, depicted, we have the infected population, the, um, the, infect the normally infected, the severely infected, susceptible and recovered, and all the interaction with medical supplies and hospitals. How is this going to be influenced by the traveling patterns and by the geographical locations? Yes, that's an important question. All right, so um, uh, I'm going to, actually this is very, uh, I do need to proceed uh, discussing uh, this, uh, this um, uh, questions here from a stakeholder and decision maker perspective because they're important. So uh, what, I, what, is, uh, what is very interesting, one of the first things I would like to do uh, in this kind of models is like, uh, obviously just, uh, just simulating the epidemics, right? It's not, I mean, by itself, we actually do have some uh, resources to fight the epidemics. If the epidemic is your enemy, the, the physicians, the vaccines, the hospitals, these are your, you know, these are your war tools, and these are your soldiers. So what exactly you are, you'll, be, you'll be doing? How, what is the, the availability of the hospital beds is, uh, is an important element and how is this going to be included into, uh, the, into the models? This also, the classical standard uh, epidemiological compartmental models, they don't deal with hospital beds. This has to be extended. A bigger paradigm should be used, something called system dynamics, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, and yes, I'm going to show models like that. Uh, another restriction uh, from a resource side is the medical supplies. Do you have another medical su enough <clears throat> medical supplies and what are the schedules for production? Um, the um, economy impact, very important. I actually, I might mention it, I might discuss it further later on, but um, I mean, obviously with the different, uh, again, with the different populations, as, uh, as it was asked in different locations, uh, different um, parts of US, you have different type of businesses and uh, there are some businesses which just cannot be closed. There are some non-essential businesses, which they really like say, bars and restaurants are considered non-essential. So <clears throat> they can be closed. So then what exactly for which regions, uh, for which of the uh, regions say in USA, how you're going to estimate the, uh, the impact of the, of the epidemics and how more of a different scenario, the different scenario playouts, which I was showing earlier, right? like how they're going to impact the economy. Like if you, whatever kind of scenarios you might be gathering and uh, you know, when you start, when you close, um, how, to, which, uh, which businesses uh, you want to, uh, to close and so forth. Um, this should be, there should be some informed uh, model about it. Uh, contact tracing is, um, is, um, is poses another kind of question. What is the minimum amount of people to adopt, say uh, the spying cell phones? you know, spying cell phone apps in order to actually have some sort of um, good, um, good picture into of what exactly is happening. The other is that obviously we can do uh, some, um, have some action protocols for people who have been traced. And now to what degree the classical models are adequate for this. And you know, this is actually, another, it's one, this can be one of the reasons, it's not the only one, but this can be one of the reasons to use the so-called agent-based modeling. And uh, so, all right, I'm going to uh, close this uh, uh, table, but I'm going to go to uh, discussing the different uh, type of models into, in, um, which are being used in epidemiology. This presentation is supposed to be much more methodological and uh, much less uh, know-how. And so here, you know, I'm talking about methodology. And, um, one of the more interesting examples I would say is to use graphs and I'm going to show you the equations and graphs. First of all, um, okay, yeah, well, uh, first of all, this uh, whatever simulation I started, it finished, you can see I have, uh, have a bigger, better partition of USA and whatever simulations I did, you know, they're now more detailed and uh, they're like, uh, say, you know, whatever I was showing earlier with, um, you probably remember they're like 23 million or something now they're like partitioned. All right, so um, I'm going to 
to uh, to ignore this for a while, and I actually wanted to present, uh, as I mentioned, this present this uh, visual aid looks better in Mathematica than in R. First of all, what are the classical models? Well, uh, the classical models they do have. Um, we use differential equations. So if you look at uh, this term here, this term, uh, so. The contact, uh, unfortunately, I don't know how well do you see this, but when I hover the mouse over this uh, uh, coefficients here, it says uh, contact rate for the affected population. The IP is the infected population, SP is the um, susceptible population. The whole thing is divided by the total population at time zero. So, and um, so we are making this differential equation. We're saying that the rate in which the susceptible population is changing is by removing people uh, who, uh, using this term, calculated with this term, also we're removing people who might die from natural causes. Say not natural, but you know, there's a deaf, deaf uh, population, here's a death rate. The, uh, the population we consider has certain death rate which we should take say, into account. This is not necessarily death rate from, uh, from disease. It can be from disease, but this is just before the phenomena, the epidemic uh, we're, we're modeling. So let's look into this term more closely. Actually, how well do you see this? Because I think it's a little bit, it's just not zoomed. Uh, right. So um, the um, uh, first of all, these two uh, these two tables they have the identical information, but it really depends what exactly you prefer. Uh, do you prefer square brackets or do you prefer the traditional form? I'm going to be discussing the traditional form of the equations. So uh, the the affected population is a function in time. So if the susceptible population, these are people who are not infected yet, but they can be infected. So what I'm going to be, um, what is happening is, um, is actually I have, uh, if I'm not infected and I'm susceptible, I have certain probability to meet the infected people. So this is IP divided by the total population. So far so good. But I don't necessarily meet, um, uh, I'm probably just meeting someone. Uh, doesn't who is uh, infected doesn't mean that I need to be infected. Maybe I need to meet uh, say five or six people within say six hours or within 10 hours or a day in order for me to get infected. This is what this uh, uh, contact rate uh, is uh, for. What I was showing earlier with the um, uh, different, um, with the, with the, the plot uh, earlier and I'm going to bring it up. So this is the, this here, I'm going to explain. This is what we're, uh, this equation more or less is looking into, into this dynamic here. I don't, uh, in the COVID-19, in case you haven't heard, uh, around 20% of the population of the infected are severely infected and the rest are normally infected. Pre predominantly all people, um, you know, get the severe, the severe, uh, in fact, the severe conditions from the, from the, um, from the disease. Uh, so there's some interaction between recovered, infected, susceptible. Um, and so here, what, what, we're, what I'm describing is that um, the susceptible population, they're meeting some of the infected people. And then we, when you get infected, some of them might die, but some of them would recover. And basically, you know, this is what is happening. It might happen, but if we don't have, um, if the virus mutates, we actually, the recovered population can become susceptible again. So I'm going to go back to this, uh, uh, to this uh, uh, equation here. This is a classical model. This is one of the simplest uh, uh, models uh, used in epidemiology modeling. One of the reasons behind uh, this um, contact rate and this, um, uh, this term here, it's the most important one. If you are in, say, live in some big university ca campus or like a village with one, I don't know, with one grocery store, one, one bus, or maybe one bus loop, you know, and uh, in some sense you are meeting everyone. So what is going to be happening is that um, uh, we actually do assume that everyone in that uh, global campus or village is, uh, can meet other people within a day. And if they don't meet the person in, uh, face to face, this, they might uh, touch the things they have touched or, you know, 
interacted with some, you know, in some way uh, through certain diff different uh, surfaces, like say, you know, in the buses, the restaurants, you know, libraries, whatever, uh, with these people. If I, let me see, can I do this here? So if I do uh, something like, I might be able to, um, yeah, if I do a highlight graph, and if I do say uh, one, four, and nine, let's see what is going to happen. Yeah, well, basically we have this, uh, three people who, uh, who are infected. Then what exactly, how exactly this is going to propagate. In some sense with this model here, just by, we're using this simple term, right? So we are assuming this kind of complete graph. We are, we are assuming that this type of structure, which by the way, it's not necessarily true in real life. And definitely if you look at some big country like USA, it's just not, it's just not adequate. That's why I was doing this uh, multi-site uh, multi partitionings. I'm saying, fine, uh, I can uh, do compartments. I, I need to look into the, each of the cities uh, individually, but maybe that's actually too fine of granularity and too expensive to simulate. That's why I'm going to do, well, that's why I was showing this partitioning with hexagons. All right, I'm going to go further with this analogy. Like say, um, look at this random graph here. This is the, um, it's a random graph which is based on uh, some sort of model for social interaction, right? The what's uh, Strogatz uh, graph distribution. So I'm making this random graph here, and uh, and let me actually produce uh, something uh, tamer, easier to observe. And now uh, I here I might uh, you can you can see what actually I'm not sure how much can you see. Let me try to see. Yeah. All right. So I mean you can see what some people now. The interpretation I have here is that each node is a person, but imagine that each node was actually a city or a town or a neighborhood. It's more or less the same kind of considerations we're going to have. Now let's look at this as a person, right? So we see that I have this person and this person interacts with this three or four in the immediate vicinity. Like say a person who is here, you know, uh, so if this person is infected, I can probably try to see how the infection propagated. Let me see, can I show you this here? So if I do, uh, yeah, you can see if I, uh, at time zero, I have uh, 193, the person or ID with 193 to be uh, the infected one. And if I, if I say go, um, okay, what is that? Yeah, I mean, if I increase the number, the the um, <clears throat> the time periods, like you know, basically every day, different people are meeting other people. So this is how uh, this is going to propagate. This infection is going to propagate, and I can make some say animation which uh, shows uh, shows this. So uh, there's um now that's an interesting part here. I forgot I did it. Well, I mean, you can. Doctor Anton. Yes. Sorry, so we have uh, a few questions. Yes. Um, I don't know if you want to take yes, them now. Let's 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 do it now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. So uh, the first one is from Victor Caramales. He says, "Have the correlation methods shown any interesting inferential results?" This is uh, one of the earlier questions. Correlation method. Yes. So I know I don't know if you've shown any of those, but I guess just generally. The, um, if we're talking about um, about the time series. Uh, uh, search engine. Uh, yeah, sure, but not not really. They're more or less expected uh, expected results. And I don't. What I would be doing is that um, because I know they they have similar distributions. Instead of say simulating, uh, I mean, might say instead of doing simulations, say um, for the countries who are clustered, I might say, look, I mean. I can do specialized simulations for each of these countries, but if I know that they're in the same cluster and they have very similar patterns of travel, I might actually say, yeah, well, it seems that um, with similar populations, similar patterns of travel, uh, the models are going to be, you know, to scale. I mean, I can assume that whatever simulations or calibration parameters I found for one of these uh, uh, for one of these cities or locations, uh, it should be applicable or at least should be good initial conditions for for more more specialized um, uh, more specialized uh, uh, calibration, I don't. Uh, I have to say I haven't I haven't thought much about it because I don't consider it uh, uh, that important. Uh, in um, in my opinion, I can always do the direct simulation. But if I see results which make sense, this also in some uh, 
it can be used to validate the data and it can be used to uh, to see uh, do we, do we get uh, i mean if we if we have similar distributions and traveling patterns similar populations i do ex i should expect also my models to have some similar outcomes at least from that perspective i can make this data useful uh, but i don't i don't see it as uh, as very important step any other questions okay thank you yes we do have another few yeah. so from omar garcia does the hospital bed data assume that the full capacity of the hospital will be used for COVID treatment? Great, great, uh, great question. Uh, it really depends what is your country, right? What is your country's policy? Like, for example, you can see, I mean, this is, let's actually, I, I spent too much uh, time discussing this and it's not that important. We're basically into the, in this uh, model, let me actually sh sh put it here. I just don't want to see here. And all right, so I have this model here, and um, and so uh, let me do this again. So uh, this model, which uh, uses uh, the hospitalized uh, population, it can have variety of parts. But you can see here, I do track uh, the hospital the hospital population, and this HB is the hospital beds. So when I when I try to get uh, the people into the hospital, I am taking into account how much hospital beds I have and how much of the population is already hospitalized. Now, uh, if I uh, if I don't like I'll, my uh, hospitals, they're not necessarily full when COVID nineteen started, right? They have been say busy at capacity fifty percent. This is going to be an initial condition for this uh, for the. Uh, for the hospitalized population, but the hospitalized population is also not does not necessarily belong to to the COVID-19 and I actually want to keep the COVID-19 people uh, to track them uh, hospitalized separately. So from that perspective, this is an interesting question, but it is uh, it is how you you stage the model uh, in Germany, for example, um, uh, they they realize that uh, with medicine becoming better, you know, people actually stay less uh, time in the hospitals, right? Instead of recovering for two weeks after operation, they need two hours or something like that. So because of this, there was some reduction in both uh, physicians and hospital beds. When COVID-19 started uh, in Germany, uh, they had, they usually, they try to be efficient. So they basically had the uh, capacity, the hospitals at capacity 70 to 80% on average, right? And so, is this the case in uh, in US? I mean, US is actually one of the countries with relatively, you know, like it has at least two two times or two point five times less number of beds than Germany. And for example, how I mean, in different locations they might have very different um, uh, very different uh, needs, both uh, of uh, of uh, physicians, of nurses, of medical supplies, and uh, the capacity of the beds. You know. It's not just uh, the number of hospital beds, but it's also what kind of supplies and what kind of uh, um, what kind of uh, care, like meaning nurses available uh, number of hours from nurses and physicians can be provided. So uh, this, but to answer the question uh, in a sense, yes, I mean when I do this kind of models, I am taking into account uh, I am taking into account um, uh, different different parts like say uh, this is the economical model and in this economic model um, I actually if I show you the full number of stocks and uh, rates I mean you can see what I'm looking into the supplies looking at the supplies demand uh, I'm looking into the delivery and production rates of supplies and so forth right so yes they need to be taken into account right now uh, I am calibrating um, uh, the hospital the the models with the initial conditions and I also and one of the reasons I plotted this I do actually expect um, the hospital beds uh, to change right so this is what they what was happening in China they built two hospitals mostly more or less overnight right and so in some other places you know they uh, you know like in New York they actually have to extend uh, the uh, uh, the um, the hospital beds in one way or the other like make a tent make a you know uh, repurpose some of the the places some of the people who are administrators uh, can can be involved into the mm, into the medical into the uh, dealing with the patients on in non-medical way like more direct way and so forth so all this is related to this uh, hospital services the number of beds uh, 
change rate, right? And so and so forth. I do assume this change rate to both increase or decrease, depending, you know, what is the policy. All right, uh, I think I answered this question too much. Um, another question? Yeah, so we have a couple more questions about uh, the inputs that the model takes. So Evan again uh -huh. asked, can the model take into account that the propensity to be susceptible is not uniformly distributed across the population. So for example, this could be due to natural immunity, age, or et cetera. Since at the moment, it's really an unknown parameter that would require a reasonable prior. Um, this, um, there are two things here. Uh, I'm doing it and I'm going to bring the simulation I was doing earlier, right? And so let me see. So one, one way to, uh, to deal with this is uh, to use this uh, geospatial temporal, uh, I mean, it's mostly the spatial part, right? So the non-uniformity of the population, I might uh, assume it here. And so each of these hexagons, they can have their own death rates or they, have, they can have their own contact rates and infectious rates and whatnot. So like what is happening here under the hood is like, for example, if I, when I scale these models, and actually, I'm showing you this in Mathematica, but it actually works in exactly the same uh, way in R. Um, when I make my initial, my initial single site seed model, I actually, and when I scale it with uh, certain traveling patterns, I might be somewhere here, I should be, you know, when I set the initial conditions and parameters, I can, I can, uh, I can set specific parameters and specific initial conditions for each of the sites I'm looking into. Uh, if I have this information, I can do that. Let me show you here, somewhere here, like say, when I'm putting the infected, right? I mean, I, you see this, this infected data structure is just, I can, I can have, um, I mean, obviously this is, uh, uh, you know, it, it's just, uh, it's, they're just numbers, but instead of just, just that, I can actually do that uh, similar thing, not just for assigning initial conditions, I can have assignment of rates and these rates, they can be site specific. They can be geographically specific. Uh, this, um, it uh, also, some of the other parts of that question, um, it might require to extend the model. Like right now, uh, what I was showing you here, you can see I have two, two infected populations, uh, the normally, normally symptomatic population and the severely symptomatic population. I might decide what I need to have four or five or 10. And this, uh, you know, this is actually not that hard to do. It's more or less what, what, is, what here is happening, you know, in this particular model. One of the things which is happening is that if you observe this uh, diagram more carefully, I'm only putting into the hospital the severely symptomatic population. The normally symptomatic, I do not. And so uh, at some point, my, my hospital is going to reach, uh, is going to reach it, its capacity, right? And I'm not going to put a new uh, severely symptomatic population people, but I'm only doing those severely symptomatic. Now, if I hit another population, like say uh, with, uh, you know, uh, not severely symptomatic, what is it? Critical, right? Say I have a infected critical uh, population, right? This is actually ICUs and so forth, right? I mean, I can add, I can add it as a separate, more or less in the same way I'm doing this here. I can add uh, separate uh, uh, treatment of uh, critical, of the critical population. Uh, all right, so any other questions? Should I proceed? Yeah, we have just two more. Um, uh -huh. One is just a clarification from Rocio. So in the model shown, there's no reinfection, right? Or Yes, she... there's no reinfection. There's no reinfection. But, and... uh, Okay, in, in the same in the same way, I'm doing this uh, multi multi models, right? Whatever combination models, I can actually in the same way I'm doing this for different locations over these different hexagons. I can do that with different strains of the virus. Okay. With meaning, I can address the infection. Okay, so we have yeah. a couple more questions um, from Mash. How well do your simulations in Mathematica provide variable interpretability? How, how what? How well do the simulations in Mathematica provide variable interpretability? Uh, Mathematica, when it comes to this type of models, it's just a better tool. I'm not sure this is the question though. Uh, I don't like what you see sure. here, for example, what these simulations you see here in Mathematica, you know, in Mathematica, I have done exactly the same 
uh, things in R. It's just I didn't um, I didn't have time to switch uh, to switch to the R implementation. But for example, this is a multi-site this is a multi-site uh, simulation of a certain graph here. I mean, yeah, it's so a regular graph. But so Mash it, just clarified. Sorry to sorry to interrupt there, uh -huh. but he just clarified. He means uh, the feature importance. So. Ah, that's, ah, okay, okay, great. Uh, so I can do this uh, since we're here, right? This sensitivity analysis is that. So, um, so in, um, it, first of all, methodologically speaking, and I'm sorry, I'm going to use the opportunity to, to preach here a little bit, but some of the questions I was asked about regression and this now about, um, you know, um, importance of variables and so forth. So regression, the way it's used in statistics and um, data science, right? We have three types of regression. We start, we use regression to, to learn what is going on. This is what this uh, time series search engine I was showing earlier was doing. So you're just using regression to investigate, to, to kind of look around and form an opinion. Then we use uh, regression to find the important variables, which actually, you know, which variables uh, produce the biggest uh, impact on the model. And the third one is to find out which parameters should be changed in order to change the outcomes. So now, uh, this, by the way, someone who comes from, say, operations research background, like, say, someone like me, I mean, why should be using regression? It's just one tool. I actually have a better way of doing this in which uh, with this kind of uh, models, with these differential equations, I can actually analyze the sensitivity uh, in a much better manner because I already I have put it in, especially after the model is calibrated. The other is what... Um, <clears throat> Uh, here, with this kind of models, uh, simu doing simulations for policies, for different policies, this is the third uh, type of application of regression. It's much easier. So I'm going to show this here. So you can see this is in R. In, uh, I have uh, taken uh, actually the same model I have been showing uh, earlier. This is the uh, susceptible exposed uh, to infected hospitalized and recovered populations. So you can see them here. I have the um, I have the recovered population, I have the hospitalized population also. These are the, this is the differential equations. I have, uh, this is the right-hand side function for R. So these equations you see here, they correspond to the equations we see here, right? And then um, I have changed the, I have changed the parameter. You can see uh, for the contact rates, this is the, uh, the contact rates of the severely symptomatic and the uh, normally symptomatic. I have changed them instead to be constant, to be functions. And now with this, when I change this to be functions, I'm also making this loop of uh, different combinations of say, uh, this actually is not a combination. This is just for the starting day of the, the starting day of the, of the quarantine. And so you can see here with the different dates, I have different uh, responses. So this is the sensitivity analysis I'm talking about. So I can see what, for example, at uh, day 50, right? Starting at day 50, this was actually quite important with the selected uh, length of uh, 56 days for the quarantine. So all the others, they actually, they either start uh, too, uh, too late or they start uh, too early. Like, so we can see 40. When I say started too early, what do I mean? Well, actually, they didn't decrease, we didn't decrease the number of um, infected severely <clears throat> And this is for the normally symptomatic, but it's the same curve for the severely symptomatic. This kind of flattening of the curve in order not to overwhelm the hospitals actually happened in this uh, value 50. So yes, this is my important, uh, important uh, value for this particular variable. I can do this uh, in higher dimensions. So you can see here, I mean, if I do, I mean, this is, uh, I think I'm looking at the depths here, but yes, I mean, instead of doing just, I'm sorry, uh, instead of doing this just for uh, for one for one parameter, I can do this for multiple parameters. This is an extremely important application. This is what this is about. This bulk simulations, batch, batch simulations, and storing of the experimental results. This is what this is about. I am trying to do as many of these experiments as possible. Also, this kind of uh, batch simulations very useful for uh, model calibration. All right. So, uh, other questions. So we have a couple more questions, but I don't know if there's something specific yeah. that you want to cover um, mm -hmm. before the end of the meetup and you want to leave these two mm -hmm. questions for the end or you'd like to take them now. Um, actually, I, I spent too much time um, dig digressing from the, 
from the main presentation, which is all fine. Everything I answered in the questions, I actually wanted to explain, but I do want to return to, uh, to, to the things I thought I'm going to say in the beginning and I didn't. This is the, this is the, 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 what is the, what are the alternatives of this uh, modeling? So I have been discussing compartmental modeling. There is something called agent-based modeling. This here, what you saw, this is very similar to what agent-based modeling is going to do. Agent-based modeling is actually following, it's doing exactly this type of, uh, uh, this type of simulations in a sense, or not simulations, but being able to trace people going around. And obviously, this, you, you basically specify how your agents act with the other agents and how they act with the environment. And obviously, if you have some kind of, um, um, if you decide to enact some policy which in, involves uh, contact tracing, right? Then actual agent-based modeling is, is a very good uh, candidate, very good method to use. One of the drawbacks of the agent-based modeling is that, um, well, first of all, in order to do it, um, you need to compare the, you need to, you need to verify your model, uh, how it uh, works uh, with the classical, compared to the classical one. There's no other way around. Uh, agent-based modeling is, um, is some sort of, um, if you are a data scientist or st statistician, or you prefer this kind of methods and uh, or machine learning engineer, then agent-based modeling is probably something you would prefer to do than say compartmental modeling. Compartmental modeling is much more top-down, meaning I'm scratching my head like this what I was showing here. I'm scratching my head and coming up with these equations and then I calibrate them. With uh, agent-based modeling, we actually, uh, we actually look at what are the actual structures, what are the actual interactions. We try to, to simulate the agents, uh, you know, like say be that people or countries or whatever, the populations as closely as possible. And then uh, we, we think this is much more bottom up uh, type of modeling. And we think in, in that way, we're going to uh, produce um, more, not necessarily, if more adequate results probably, yes, most likely, but also with this approach, you can put a lot of scenarios which are probably hard to, to model using, um, using, the, um, using the, um, the classical compartmental models. I have decided to go with the classical compartmental models as much as possible doing this uh, multi-site simulations because uh, in some sense, whatever model you'll be doing, you'll be going back to the classical models in order to verify what's going on. And also because they're very well known. They're very, very well known how they perform. And uh, if I need to produce some uh, framework which uh, gives adequate results relatively quickly, which was the, the reason I developed this, well, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll try to adopt the classical methods to, um, uh, to, you know, to, the, to, the, to the problem at hand. So the third, uh, I'm not sure about the cellular automata, they actually address uh, quite a lot of uh, things. I'm not sure how much uh, people know about cellular automata. Let me see if I, if I can show you this. So yeah, several automata, they, um, it's a, it's like, we're basically uh, simulating how the cells change because of some neighborhood uh, configurations. And so um, and this is more or less what is happening here. I mean, you can see this is some sort of stable, this is actually game of life. Uh, and so uh, this, um, I mean, we, with this cellular automata, we can actually, they have the positions in the geographics and you can incorporate, you can incorporate the actual interaction of the rules of the different populations here. Uh, on that remark, and I'm not going to go further than that, but uh, John Conway, who, the inventor of, uh, and uh, this is supposed to work, but it didn't. Okay, I'm not going to fight it too much. All right, so the inventor of, um, um, of uh, the game of life, uh, he recently passed away because of, um, because of uh, uh, COVID-19 actually. So you can see, I mean, this is the tribute from SKCD. He, I think he passed away on April 11th. Yeah, due, due to complications. He was 72 years old, but he did pass away because of complications uh, from COVID-19. Um, this, this was more or less uh, the, the bigger picture. I don't think we have that much time to, to explain uh, further the differences between the models, but I think I mentioned more or less all of the all of the things I wanted to mention. Uh, the, we discussed already the basic compartmental models uh, because uh, I see that probably well like uh, 10, 15 more minutes, I'm going to actually discuss one of the models here. This is the, um, 
economical model. And uh, some of the some of the questions I heard they might be answered in this um, in that way. So um, this is um, kind of the last part of the talk. In that particular talk, that particular model, I'm going to discuss. There's um just a moment. Yeah, I'm going to do it in Mathematica and didn't have time to to write the equations in uh, in R. Uh, but yes, I'm looking into this uh, model here, and this is the the system of equations I was discussing. So uh, to be to be more clear of what what I, what we are modeling, I'm going to go to this uh, to this uh, diagram. So. I have two populations, severely infected, symptomatic, uh, normally symptomatic. I have the recovered and the susceptible. As I said, some of them die. Uh, I'm only putting into the hospital the symptomatic one. The hospitals themselves, they obviously, uh, they, they, have some, they have some needs of, say, supplies. And so uh, it's an interesting question, who is producing the supplies, with what rate, what kind of storage they have. And after they have produced the supplies, how quickly they are brought up to uh, to the um, to the hospital. So I mean, for all of these uh, activities, we can uh, trace or track the money uh, being put in. And so, and you can see what I mean. Basically, if you are, if you have more beds, then actually less of the severely infected people are going to be uh, say. Uh, out of the hospitals, the death rates are going to be smaller and so forth. So this is what, uh, what this uh, model is, uh, is uh, showing. And um, it's, um, I'm actually putting different uh, conditions. Just a moment. So this here is a quarantine scenario. This basically tells me about how the contact rates uh, change uh, from different, uh, apologize. The contact rates uh, is say at certain level, say 0 0.56. But then if we have a lockdown between a day 60 and day 106 or whatever, right, it's uh, going to be say 10% uh, of uh, how much they put here. Ah, okay, 0 0.25, four times less or three times less. So uh, yeah, four times less. And so this is how, basically this is how I simulate the lockdown. Uh, I have a similar type of simulation for the supplies. So my supplies, the trucks which uh, come here, the trucks from the, uh, this truck from the warehouse of the medical supplier, right, producer, uh, it comes every day. But imagine that it actually gets delayed and it comes twice every three days or whatever, right? So this is another kind of uh, uh, type of scenario here I can model. So. Uh, here we can see the different uh, when the quarantine starts. What are the what is the effect on the on the number of infected people, the time evolution of infected people, and um, again, actually to do that, I might have probably put all of the the beds to be uh, a, quite a lot somewhere here. Let me see. Well, I cannot see that. Yeah, okay. I do remember that I changed the number of beds to be. Uh, to be a large number because uh, I didn't want to kind of the number of bits to influence this uh, this diagram here. So I mean this is a simple interactive interface with which I can change uh, different parameters and see how things are developing. But what is more interesting here is what what happens with the you know with the different delivery periods. Uh, what is the effect on the hospitalized population? And so you can see here what if the truck comes once in a day, which was my reference point, I get this curve. If they come twice in a day, then I'm fully utilizing the, the hospital beds. And if they come like say, you know, uh, if they delayed like 1.8, which was in my scenario, I mean, you can see what this actually means that uh, I'm using the hospital beds at much less capacity. The hospital beds, they might be available, but because I don't have enough medical supplies, there is no reason for me to hospitalize people. This is the reason we see the effects on the hospitalized population from uh, just by changing the delivery period. In all of these situations, you might have heard it's a very good idea to look at the area under the curve, uh, which is more indicative for certain things, like say the area under the curve when we're looking into this, um, uh, they might, it might be not dramatically different. But if we have reduced the peak, that's actually very good because say, you know, the hospitals are not overwhelmed. So um, here, uh, I have done just a separate, uh, separate um, 
investigation of the medical supplies and uh, the production rate, uh, the availability of the medical supplies, uh, depending on the production rate. But the most interesting plot is probably somewhere here. So, so here basically, I'm uh, I'm changing the the delivery the delivery period, and I have different type of uh, disruptions. The way I was showing here, this disruption. Uh, yeah, this disruption, this disruption, I can vary when it starts and say it's only for one week. I think this is what I put here. So the, my delivery is, dis, you know, disrupted, but it's for, you know, becomes nearly twice slower, but it's just for one week. What is exactly the effect on the, on the hospitalized population? So this is what this plot is showing. So this is, I mean, you can see it's a highly nonlinear interaction. And uh, although we have some of these complicated curves, uh, if you look at the, I mean, which day-to-day -day they might be important, right? But if you look at the area under the curve, I mean, they kind of uh, compare, compare fairly well. All right, so this was actually my, uh, my um, in this diagram here, I was uh, showing, uh, oh, all right, sorry. Uh, this is the this is the model I wanted to discuss. I discussed everything else, so I, I don't need to mark this right now. But uh, this is what we what we're doing. The multi-site modeling, I actually discussed it to a large degree already. But I do want to mention that uh, in a, in order to I mean I just showed you some you know simulation with uh, sorry this doesn't need to be in Mathematica. I showed you some simulation that uh, was done over USA. But how do I know that these models work correctly? And so one, one of the ways for me to convince myself is to do, is to do this uh, normal, this um, expected type of um, expected or like, say if I have this regular grid and I do my simulation, uh, I would expect certain, certain things to happen. And uh, what is this movie here, which I'm going to show, is just showing how uh, an infected person from the bottom left is uh, going, you know, is the, how the infection is going to propagate wave-wise uh, throughout the whole, throughout the whole region. What is exactly happening? And unfortunately, again, with R, with these uh, graphs, it's just not easy to show. But basically, this here, it's a regular graph. And um, so, yeah, I'm actually, I'm not going to even try that. So I'm going to, for the sake of time, I'm going to be using Mathematica for this. So I have a regular graph like this. And so I'm starting, uh, I'm having people who go from this node. I mean, you can see all the, the arrows, they show how people travel between the different sites. Each of these sites say it's a city, right? And you can see that all uh, vertical traveling, um, uh, traveling is happening uh, you know, upwards in this graph and uh, from um, uh, right to left, uh, if it is horizontal. So what I, when I do the, my simulations, I would expect, uh, because everybody's living uh, city one, the, the population to severely decrease. I also expect uh, the population here to increase just because people are migrating to that direction. Uh, the other thing is, yeah, I'm using constant, uh, constant uh, traveling patterns. And another thing which I'm doing here, is that I'm also, and I, I'm going to switch back to my um, R simulation. Uh, I'm actually uh, having, when I put uh, this, um, when I put my infected people, you can see that I'm actually having only one infected person in site one, this uh, underscore one. So I'm starting at the, when, I, when I'm looking into this graph, I'm starting at this node one. I have one infected person and I wanna see how this one, you know, this person with one infection, how the infection is going to propagate to, to the others. Because of the traveling patterns, I should expect certain wave-like uh, distribution of the infection. And more or less, this is what is happening here. After I have made the simulations, you can see that there is a clear front, how from the beginning of this, um, you know, from the bottom part, I mean, you know, this, uh, you know, this note here, it uh, starts, uh, starts here. I mean, I can see how in this animation, it basically uh, I can verify what the model is working. So what I was showing earlier in the previous, uh, in the previous uh, uh, for the previous questions, when I was showing uh, the, um, the parts which are like uh, taking, um, uh, making the simulations over the whole USA, I am, I, I am having a certain uh, graph, connectivity graph between these sites 
and I am simulating uh, uh, what is happening on each of them. I can plot the global population across all of USA, and then I can uh, just concentrate on certain areas like Miami and New York. So, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, if I want, I can do more detailed, uh, more detailed um, investigations about some of the uh, obtained results. All right, I think um, uh, this was uh, everything I wanted to discuss. I mean, I wanted to discuss some other things, but uh, for you know, I think I covered most of the things I wanted to discuss, and I think we're close to you know to the time limit. I'm ready for questions. Yes, yes, Anton. Uh, there's one more question from Leslie. Mm -hmm. um, this is very interesting. Uh, we are bombarded daily with news articles of governments underreporting coronavirus cases or revising methods of counting those infected. How do you determine the data being used from sources such as the New York Times as accurate? How do you account for such reportings in the modeling process? Well, uh, I don't because this is not uh, I don't need to be concerned with this. The quality of the data is more or less given. Now, I'm developing the, meta, the method. Okay, so what I was showing here, as I said, it's mostly methodological, which, um, and you know, I'm kind of, I'm not just kind of excusing myself here. I'm going to explain. Um, it's, um, I've been using this analogy before. It's like making the violin, not playing the music. And uh, this question is more about playing the music kind of side, meaning, uh, after you have developed the tools and you trust them and you know what they what they can do, how exactly you um, you apply them in the, into the real situation? Well, uh, it is it is important to calibrate, as I said, and trying to calibrate as quickly as possible. So one of the things here I'm going to show you is, uh, for example, let me let me bring this up here. It's uh, it's related to this uh, question. So this is the original dashboard. This is in Flex uh, the Flex dashboard, right? I put uh, some real data from Hubei. Uh, so the only difference between this, uh, this dashboard here and this one is that I have put uh, this, uh, this real data, right? And so I'm going to run this. Um, and so now with my model, uh, whatever I have, uh, have model, and this is somewhat simple, but still, you know, the, the analogy stands. So I need to see, first of all, the data, the way it is given to me, obviously there was some kind of um, exposure period. So I need to be able to say offset the data, right? And so I'm going to kind of offset, this is the Hubei data. I mean, you can see uh, this is the, in uh, blue, I think is the recovered population. And this one here is the, it's the, uh, the, no, in purple is the recovered population and the infected is in blue right in these dots and so i might first try to because i'm trying to calibrate right i'm trying to kind of get this here but you see hubei is also like uh, the state hubei it's like 50 60 million people obviously they did some lockdown and some other things what i'm starting here it's like hundred thousand people so something else has been an effect either my model is wrong or they have been some under reporting or there are some effects which i don't know about like say the severe lockdown or some other things, right? So ideally, I can be doing this kind of, I mean, I'll be, a, say, if I adjust some of the other, uh, the other parameters, right? This is going to be changing. So, uh, I mean, my point is, I can try to adjust some of these parameters in order to try to calibrate my model. Okay, so yeah, this seems to be, okay, like, so, I mean, it's not exactly the curve I wanted, but I mean, I can see that if I offset this less, I mean, start to get it close or whatever, right? My point is that, I can experiment, I don't need to, I can do it semi-manually or semi-automatically. I can do this kind of experiments in order to see how much my models uh, reflect reality. And uh, given what we know, I mean, given like how, how this is supposed to perform, what exactly, you know, what exactly has been, if we're told, is this evolution, you know, adequate? I do know that say with this uh, special, special effects, right? Like uh, using this actually produce some kind of, uh, effects which are not particularly easy to explain. You produce certain distributions which you cannot produce just by not using the special uh, the special distribution and the traveling patterns and some other things like that. So these models I do after I have informed myself about the the quality the qualities uh, they have qualitatively how these models do. Like this is when I skip the calibration, just knowing how these models perform under what conditions, and I have built some confidence with the calibration. 
I should be able to answer questions like that. I should be able to do some kind of, you know, forensics, you know, of the data. Any other questions? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. We have a question from Thomas Chen. He's asking, what type of visualization tools do you use to visualize um, visualize the relationship between the hospitalization rates and economic impact? Is that mathematical? Uh, yeah, but, well, uh, right. Uh, I mean, you can use both R and mathematical. Like, okay, let me bring this example. Um, in my, my, I mean, this plot, for example, yeah, I did it in Mathematica with the, whatever it was, uh, say the medical supplies and some other things, but you don't, you don't have to use Mathematica for, for this or to, to just obtain the plots. The biggest, the biggest uh, difficulty I would say using, uh, not using Mathematica is how do you, Mathematica has a first class uh, numerical integration solver. And so I had to do quite a lot of adjustments in order to, to, make, uh, to make the solvers you know, available in R to be able to use with them. And the solvers in R are great, right? It's just mm -hmm. Mathematica, it's much more integrated. And so the function in dissolve in Mathematica has a, a much better way of dealing with things. And so some of the things you see here in this, in this uh, type of uh, simulations and the way I call in dissolve, it's uh, I had to spend quite a lot of time to emulate this, and I'm not. I know that this is not the question, but uh, this is this is actually one of the things I I wanted to discuss. Like say, uh, when I when I have this um, type of models here, right? And I'm going to show you the equations. Uh, I think I'm going to show the equations. Yeah. So uh, it takes uh, quite a lot of manipulation of the right hand side. Uh, of this, this equations to kind of see how these models are going to scale. Like for example, if I'm trying to do some more complicated model and let me try to, to bring up this notebook here, maybe bus simulation, let me see. Um, in this, um, no. All right, so oh, let me see here. Uh, when I modify these models, right? I mean, you can see what, for example, I'm trying to, to, do, to do different. Here, I have uh, scaled the model with three different sides. And in order to be able to scale this model using this matrix to have these uh, three different sides, I had to do quite a lot of transformations inside, inside, the, inside the, uh, the actual function, right? So let me see. I don't know why is this not, uh, not developing, but all right. I'm going to make another attempt to run this. And so anyway, uh, and I'm going to give up if it doesn't. All right, what exactly is this? All right, so there's some problem here. All right, fine. Uh, just a moment. So if I, if I make some evaluations here and I'm trying to make the point. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, whatever kind of uh, whatever kind of uh, uh, equations I had, I had to do some kind of code, code transformations in order to produce these uh, new equations, this multi compartment mo compartmental model which incorporates these three sites. Or similarly, if I have thousands of sites, right? But in Mathematica, I don't. This is actually much easier to do and feed to end this off. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, I, again, I, I know this was not the question, but in my opinion, no, you visualize it in whatever way. Visualization is the last, uh, is the last uh, concern. It's more like how do you derive the simulations? Any other questions? Good, I think we lost him a butt. Uh-huh. I think uh, we covered all the questions. Um, there's one more, if we can make this one quick. I sure. don't think we covered yes, this I one. I promise. Um, or did we just cover this one? The good illustration of the application of the R language. The what? Did we just cover this question from Theodore? I was hoping that this seminar would illustrate an application of R language and modeling. 
can you tell me where to go to find the good illustration of the application of the R language for this type of modeling? Well, we made a, first of all, we made a, a preliminary poll and it seems, and this is one of the things I actually wanted to discuss uh, how we do the, the technical part and how we do design the frameworks and so forth, right? Unfortunately, this was, I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, I do actually want to talk about methodology. So yeah, this was the opportunity for me to take, talk about methodology. Um, the, the particular thing I'm discussing here, I'm not sure uh, what is the, what is exactly the question. Some of the, some of the, um, the R language itself is very arcane. It's not necessarily something I would recommend to beginners. And, uh, but the good news is what to say R Studio, which is what you see here, the company R Studio saturates the ecosystem of uh, R with uh, packages which make, uh, which make uh, the usage of R very easier. The, back, the, the drawback of the approach taken by R Studio is that you need to learn quite a lot of keywords when it comes to manipulating data and some other things like that. But they do, they're extremely popular and they do transfer. I mean, they do transfer fairly well. And now, you know, our studio is, uh, you know, it's uh, producing very good quality uh, products which uh, simplify further applications of, uh, of using R. Like say, this dashboard I was saying, some of the links I published, they were actually, I was showing, you know, the, the, shiny, the shiny server which our studio hosts. And, you know, if I want to communicate to other people how these models work, I can use this uh, shiny server. I wouldn't, uh, I, I would say uh, the Tidyverse tutorials, they, they're the ones, and I'll be more concrete here, and I apologize, this was lots of hand waving, but it made lots of sense to me, whatever I said. And the Tidyverse, um, um, uh, Tidyverse, uh, well, one of the, this is one of the functions in, in Tidyverse, but look into the examples uh, of, uh, of Tidyverse. This would, I would say, this is the, um, this is the way to start. This guy, Hadley Wickham, he's, uh, you know, 10 years ago or whatever, he was the sanest person, I guess, doing R. Uh, and his ideas were adopted. He was, uh, he's the senior scientist or, you know, developer in, in R Studio. And uh, as I said, uh, R Studio, uh, have saturated the ecosystem of uh, of R programming with um, uh, packages which might make your life much easier. The graphics and whatever I was showing earlier, like say these graphics, they're also written by, by R Studio, by Hadley Wickham, this ggplot and etc. All right, was this quick enough? Or... <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Not really. laughs> Anton, there's one last question. Uh -huh. I think this is probably related to what you mentioned about the compartmental model. Yeah. Um, the question is, would you be able to take into account the variability in people behavior regarding quarantine, like for example, homeless people, and that some people need to go to work to survive, people who care more about going back to normal life than staying safe? Etc., um, which I think is the reality, all, at least in the U United States. <laughs> all great questions. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, let me let me answer. I'll use the opportunity to uh -huh. one of the models sure. which I I find uh, fascinating. I'll keep this in less than two minutes, I guess. Mm -hmm. So um, sure. let me bring first up first this um, uh, the morphological analysis table. So. Yeah, basically, uh, this type of questions, right? How do you deal with the, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's kind of related to the, uh, to the contact tracing, but also how do we, I mean, I would have, should have put it here, right? How do we accommodate how people are dealing with the quarantine, right? And now uh, my initial, my initial uh, response, uh, because similar question was asked, I'm just doing this uh, side, uh, side compartments, but Ideally, with uh, the way I'm doing the, um, the way I'm separating my models and what I was showing, what I'm doing in R, right? Like uh, what I was showing in R, I was showing how I can make new compartments by using matrices and whatnot. Imagine that this kind of code ma manipulation or model manipulation is something I can do uh, in many directions, in many modeling directions, not just from a geospatial uh, perspective, but also from the type of, uh, uh, you know, say ages, you know, socioeconomic status and so forth, right? So by definitions, all these are compartments. I'll just have uh, a much bigger set of uh, equations. Like say, when I, uh, the number of equations, when, when we do this, 
they become like say you know thousands of equations and yes we can accommodate the different compartments the question is how do you specify this and so and to and obviously we can ask ourselves uh, you know, is the compartmental modeling uh, adequate? But yes, I, it can be applied and it has been applied. Now, the alternative of this is to use agent-based modeling. As I mentioned earlier, like if you have an agent-based modeling, uh, this would have been much more, in, much easier to put uh, this uh, random agents type of behavior to program it. I mean, this is actually before the revolution which happened with neural networks and machine learning. Machine learners, this is what they were doing before that, doing machine learning. They would program quite a lot of, they'll use programming and uh, programming routines to incorporate the, what they know about the problem. Not so much uh, mathematical artifacts, which say the physicians, uh, sorry, the statisticians do. Now, why, there's a, there's a sim interesting, because this is like contact tracing related and etc. Imagine uh, there's some um, wastewater, basically uh, this is, you know, toilet water, right? I mean, they actually, it looks like that you can find the virus there. And people who uh, who are already uh, have the symptoms and have the, um, uh, they actually, they don't have the symptoms, but they're already infected and they're going to be symptomatic soon. You actually can see this uh, uh, from the wastewater from they say house or whatever it is. Imagine you have a, uh, you actually, every house in US, has an internet of thing device, you know, which model, which uh, follows or analyzes the wastewater. And then you actually can see, you know, how, you know, you can try to predict what are the infections where, where these are going. Now the homeless people, uh, okay, well, we need to actually have a separate, you know, this internet of things or whatever I was talking about. We need to have a separate way of, uh, of, modeling, uh, of modeling them, they behavior in that way. And yes, this can be incorporated into the models. Let me, I mean, this is my answer, and I, I think I answered it. I can find some map or chart, which, yeah, okay, well, whatever. This is very simple, but yeah, basically what I was saying, what I just said, we just monitor the wastewater and et cetera. So I'm saying that the waste, I mean, obviously the granularity of the wastewater processing plant is too big, but maybe at the house level or whatever, where the, you know, where the homeless are supposed to, you know, congregate. I mean, we can do this kind of analysis. All right, I think I, I mean, I'm done with my answer. It's another question, did I answer it, but. Okay, I, I think we, we just have a couple of good comments. Mash says brilliant. And I think there was one more comment that said, nice touch on the ash vases. So those are like good comments. Uh -huh. Anyways, I think we are, we are done with all the questions. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Antono. This was brilliant. We really appreciate your time and effort with this presentation. Amazing. Thank you so very much. Yeah, Looking forward you. to see you in future. Yeah, <laughs> um, Denise, and thank you so much. Yes, yeah, you. and we will be um, posting his material and the, the link for this video to come. Um, he is sharing all of this material uh, on GitHub and we you can find, we will fork it and you'll find it uh, on Our Lady's Miami GitHub account. All right. And don't forget next meetup um, is June 11th and we're going to be here with uh, Gabriela Queiroz. Thank you again everyone for joining us. Thank you so much Anton. Yeah. And thank you thank so you. much Our Ladies. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.